music. <laughs> This guy is vintage 1967. Gonna give you a little bit of uh, history on this guy. A little bit of a reason of why I opted for this to be my snub nose. I don't think I'll get another one. I wanted one. You know I'm on this revolver kick recently. I don't have a snub nose. I wanted one. It was always a contentious thing. What? Which one am I gonna get? Did a lot of research. Opted on this guy. I'm gonna tell you why I picked this guy. I'm going to give you a little heads up on a little bargaining tool I used when I was in the uh, local gun store purchasing it. Thought about it on the way home and thought it would be kind of cool to include it in the video. Exactly what uh, I'm pretty good at bargaining. So I figured maybe that could be part of the video, even discussing uh, my bargaining tools. And uh, like I said, just showing a little bit of, uh, you know, why I opted for the detective special with my limited amount of knowledge. Um, again, did a little bit of research. See, the problem with me is I'm not, what are the problems with me? I, uh, I don't have brand loyalty, uh, which is it'd be easy for a Smith & Wesson guy to get a stub nose if his options are knocked down. Or if it was a cold guy, I mean, this is where you go. You're either deciding do I want one in alloy? Do I want one in, uh, you know, do I want it nickel plated or just blued me i have to look across the board because uh, i love them all so i really got to just see which one is best for me kind of thing going across the whole gambit well i got a bunch of smith and wessons i kind of like smith and wesson i look to them first oh by the way this is uh history of smith and wesson by mr roy g jinx favorite smith and wesson book here's the thing I have one of these, okay? I don't know where, not the gun. I have this instruction book. I don't know where I acquired it. It's original. It's, uh, let's see, does it actually have like a date on the bottom? Somewhere in here maybe it has like a copyright date for this exact. April 1955 is where they date the warranty. So this thing is pretty old. I think that's right around when this chief special started, you know what I mean? So if, uh, if I ended up with one of these, it would be really cool. I like to tie things together. I have one of these. I would have the instruction book if I got one. The Model 36 is a five-shot Smith & Wesson snub nose revolver. But after looking at them and seeing that they're five-shot, then getting into some of the other ones, like this Colt, I realized that this stays at six-shot and... I'm able to still use my speed loader, which fits in there. So even with this instruction book, I decided to pass on, uh, on that one. So, but there's, there's others. Let's take a look here. You get into the later on in Smith & Wesson, right? You know, I mean, there's a lot of this book that just covers, you know, old stuff here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, here's where we get into the stub nose revolvers. These are K-frame. K frame. These are like the Combat Magnums, actually. And I have a oh, Combat Masterpiece. This one was called. But look, I, you know, I got, uh, here's my, uh, here's my 1963 uh, 357 Combat Magnum. It would look lovely next to this guy, right? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of Smith & Wessons. Got the Model 29. Ooh, big boy. Yep. I even have the, uh, if you remember, the uh, K-22, which is uh, another, this is a K-frame. Of course, the 29 is the N-frame. The uh, Model 10 that we just did the video on, it would look great with those guys. You know what I'm saying? But I 
then the J frame, of course, which is the five shot. This is the Chief Special right here, 38 Chief Special. This is what would go with that instruction book. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I did. I, I looked at them. I looked at them carefully. I was poking around with them for the last few years in gun stores. But something, something was bringing me back to my pair of Colts here. This pair of Colts. I love these guys. This is a 1916 uh, Army Special and a 1926 Colt Officers model. I love these guys. I really do. And I said, you know what? These are the only Colt handguns or the only Colt revolvers I have. So I decided let's look hard let's look hard and long into the Colt thing and really see, you know, what they have to offer as far as uh, their example here. After looking I really fell in love with its uh, history. So the history is actually that this thing started 1927 was its first issue. They have different series for these things. All right, so just to throw this out there, the first issue was 1927 to 1946. They had a checkered hammer, checkered trigger. They had like checkering here on the uh, cylinder latch cylinder opening latch uh, it had a much shorter ejector rod here and uh, I think the frame even was a little I'm looking, let's see if the frame was different I don't think so so the second issue which is what this guy's part of was from 47 to 72 the checkering on the hammer was turned to grooves the checkering on the trigger was turned to grooves and the checkering was taken off of the cylinder latch to make it smooth. And it has a longer ejector rod. This is Joe, if it's laying like behind the glass in a gun show cabinet, this, this information is really just so, you immediately make that, you know, once I started doing research, I'd look and go, oh, there's a first series, there's a third series, there's a, whatever, third issue. So the third issue was 73 to 86. It had an ejector rod housing down here. It was uh, the first one that was rated for plus P ammo. And then they stopped making them in 86. They came back again in 93 with what's called the fourth issue. It was from 93 to 95. Some people say it was like a parts cleanup. But uh, basically, um, it was very popular. They did release it again from 93 to 95 with rubber Packmeyer grips. So it looks like the third issue, but with rubber Packmeyer grips, that's how you tell the fourth issue. Not sure again if there's any other huge differences besides the grips. I don't know. But uh, these guys started it all in 1927. That was one of the things that really led me to them as well. And what's really interesting is the development started with something called the Fitz Special. Okay, so now, of course, as with any of these things that we notice, we start going down these rabbit holes. So what is Fitz? Fitz is John Henry Fitzgerald. He was an employee of Colt from 1918 to 1944, who came up with this concept around the mid-20s. Uh, this guy was a competition shooter, uh, exhibition shooter, all-around gun expert. Supposedly worked for the NYPD. I don't know if he had a career from from 18 to 44, how he worked for the NYPD, how he squeezed that in there. I don't know. Maybe he was moonlighting, but he, uh, this guy definitely knows his stuff. And there's a book, of course, you might have to get it. It's on Amazon. Another book, but supposedly this is a great book about old school shooting. Like old school, this guy wrote this book a long time ago. It's one of the classics. Anyway, again, another rabbit hole, another book, right? Uh, so the Fitz Special, he modified a police positive special um, by shortening the barrel to two inches 
shortening the ejector rod, bobbing the hammer, rounding the butt, removing the front half of the trigger guard, and reshaping that, uh, uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> uh, reshaping the hammer and the butt allows the gun to be drawn quickly with little risk of the weapon snagging on clothing. The hand trigger facilitates quick trigger acquisition, even for shooters with larger gloved fingers. And uh, not many of these things uh, made, they say, less than 100. Some people say they were 200. Some people say as few as 40. Uh, I don't know if they really kept such crazy records on these things because it was just a concept thing. But supposedly you could buy it. It wasn't in the catalog, but if you wanted one and you specially requested it, one would be custom made for you. And uh, this is what started it all. This was so popular, just the idea became so popular that it, was, it became the prototype for the Colt Detective Special, which was the first production two-inch snub-nosed revolver. Uh, even after the introduction of the Detective Special in 27, Fitz continued to make custom revolvers for special clientele. So, uh, yeah, that was the story. The idea was familiar to me. And uh, I was, it was bothering me. I was kind of wondering why. I was like, why does this seem so familiar? And then it, uh, it came to me. And um, what it was, was it was reminding me of the Detonics, which was, of course, the um, 45. And then the Detonics guys, I have a video on this if you really want to poke around and do, and do some... Uh, do some looking around on my videos, you'll find it. The Daytonics guys, and let me see, there's a book for that too. Here's my, <laughs> here's my book for that. It's Combat Master by Alan Chin. Uh, this is a weird book, by the way. It does have some interesting stuff talking about the gun, but it also, it's like a half martial art book. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of strange. It's got a lot of literature, a lot of, uh, not, you know, like not much writing, really. So it's like a lot of pictures, and the text is like separated by these huge paragraphs. So people make fun of this book, but but it's a pretty cool book. It's not crazy expensive, and it's the only literature you'd be able to read on this thing that you didn't find online, obviously. But I mean, it's like there's, uh, there's a lot of specific information in there on it. But look at how they cut down the back and bobbed the hammer, shortened the grip, so much so that, uh, you know, it uses its own proprietary magazine where the follower sticks out the bottom here when it's fully loaded because it didn't even fit. All the cuts, all the reliefs to make it smaller. And they had to change the whole action, the whole system here to make it work with the lighter slide. The uh, grip safety's gone. The tonics. Check that out. But that's what... That's what was so familiar to me. That's what uh, made me think about this fit special and what, what he was doing. But it's kind of like backwards because the Daytonics, they took a 45, which had been around for a long time, a Colt 45, and they, they modified the 1911 to be smaller. Um, these guys, it's the, it's the other way around. It's the the gun that they made smaller is what led to an actual model. You know what I mean? That didn't even that didn't even exist yet. Well, in a way, I guess there's a similarity because there are there are a lot of compact 45s around now that were not around back before the Daytonics. But what I'm saying is that Fitz didn't really have anything to work with. It's not like he um, it's not like he was moving into into a uh, genre that existed. I'm not even sure if what I'm saying makes any sense because uh, the Daytonics guys didn't really have a. They worked from an actual model, just kind of like what the, kind of like what Fitz did here. But he didn't really change. Let's say I guess what I'm trying to say is, he didn't really change the shape of the frame or anything like that. It's not like he was cutting down the frame. He bobbed the hammer, and uh, he uh, cut the barrel shorter, cut the ejector rod shorter, made the butt a little bit more rounded. But the frame itself basically stayed the same. You know what I mean? Um, well, anyway, 
I guess you could argue that point. That's a, it is a good point to do the comparisons there between what they did with the, uh, with the Daytonics. But it, it, it reminded me of what was going on, the concept, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, so then let's see. The paperwork I have here talks about the series already, but we already, we already did that. Colt filed for bankruptcy protection in 1992. So that might have had something to do with uh, that might have had something to do with uh, this fourth issue coming online. After reorganization, they started production of the detective special again. So this reorganization might have been somebody that said, "Hey, let's bring back something that was doing pretty well, but it was only really around for another couple of years." But then they introduced other guns: the, the, the stainless steel SF six XF. Uh, SFBI, I don't even know what that is, but that was the replacement. That was the replacement. I got it right here. There it is. There's a picture of it. That was the replacement for the uh, Detective Special. And uh, yeah, here it is right here. Sure thought I whole lot, had a whole lot more to say, but here's the story. Let me tell you specifically about this guy now. Obviously, the, the history part of this uh, whole video fell apart. Let's go into like this guy now. When I walked in to the gun store, I was looking at some Smiths. This time, you know, I've been looking for one of these, and I saw a Cobra. Now, the Cobra, if you remember, we just got over the Kennedy stuff, and I threw a bunch of pictures up. Uh, and one of them was of Ruby's, Jack Ruby's gun that he killed Oswald with. And uh, what's interesting, they talk about like tactics with these things, as far as like, oh, they're not accurate, and they're not. It, they're a pain in the ass to shoot. They're not. They're not accurate. You know what I mean? But this, this photo right here. This shows exactly what these things are made for and used for. So Jack Ruby definitely picked the right kind of gun. These things, they call them belly guns or something, like as if you just stick it in someone's belly and pull the trigger. These things are made for close range engagements, period. End of story. You know what I mean? So I just thought this picture tells a lot. But that uh, would have been kind of cool. I said, yeah, I want to... It would be kind of cool to get one of those, the Cobra there. that And, and that cover that you see on it is on the, over the hammer is actually something you could order from the factory if you wanted to. So I'm like, you could probably find one exactly like that. Then finding out that the Cobra is actually um, alloy. It's alloy. So it's, it's really not the same. Just holding them and, you know, tapping on the side plate and just the sound of it and the feel of it. I did not like it, you know, and they had issues with them where I think originally the cylinders were alloy too, but then they dropped that really quick, but then the military wanted them, so they made them for the military, and it didn't take long before the military realized why they dropped them, so then that whole thing was a whole debacle, and I think the same thing happened with Smith & Wesson, with their air weight guns also, with the, it's just the, the cylinders definitely, um, Back then, I, I don't know if any in the like after that. I'm pretty sure there's alloy cylinders now, but back then, it wasn't working. It wasn't working good. So um, I felt a couple of those, didn't like them, and then I saw this one sitting there. Now, of course, it did have a pretty high price tag, but it was unused. No box, no papers, nothing like that. But it said, "Never fired." It's kind of curious when you see that. I always like to look at them and be like, never fired, really? Well, let's take a look here. Let me take a close look at this thing. Never fired, huh? Taking a look here. Taking a look here. Looking up by the forcing cone here. Let's get in there and show you what I was looking at. I think from the factory, you know, they might fire it once or twice or something. So saying never fired can never really be 100% true. But look, there's, there's no drag mark. If there's a slight drag mark, it's me since I got it home. Yeah, I would say uh, there's a good chance that it was never fired. I loved the condition. For 1967, I mean, look at this. Look at the wood. It still has, like, the flash from, like, manufacturing. I'm really surprised it doesn't have a box. So that's usually the kind of gun that comes out of the box. 
But um, I decided to go for it. I decided to go for it. I gotta tell you, don't let me forget to tell you about my bargaining process. So now, let's zoom out. What's the dog barking at? Dog barks at the mailman every day, but it's a little early for the mailman. So what do we got here? Colt Book of Firearms. Maybe Charlie wants to be in another video. R.L. Wilson. This is the second edition of this book. Signed. Nice. Uh, this is an awesome book. You can find them. They're on Amazon. You know, they're around. Uh, the second edition one is cheaper than there's a third edition out now that might be close to 200 bucks. But you can still get this second edition one. It's around. This is uh, published in 71. Well, that's the first edition. The second edition... I think it was 93. Where did it say? I saw it somewhere. Yeah, here it is. 93. And then uh, and then he, he, he signed this in 94, I believe. Yeah, he signed this to somebody in 94. I love this book. So let's get into it. Let's, uh, let's catch up to where we're at. So here yeah, we're still at single action, single action army. Uh, here we start moving into some revolvers, but... Still too old for what we're looking for. Too old. Pocket positive. Do we want to go a little before that, I think? Where are we starting from? We have to get to the change. Here's the fits. Now we have to get to the change. It's the... This is the officer's models. Well... These original Fitz ones were chambered and they weren't 38s, you know what I mean? They were in 45. Well, there was another caliber. Uh, I'm not going to... I don't have it right here on this page, but it was like 40-something, you know? And it was, like, it was like one of these older calibers. That's what the original Fitz ones were, were, were in. But these, you're looking right here at snub nose revolvers that... Never existed yet. Like, snub nose revolvers were not even a thing. This is where it first started. And then it was this police positive. Here, the positive. When it starts saying positive, this is where they started changing to more modern, where they were like, see, these are in 32. Thirty-two here. The police positive. Thirty-eight. This was the revolver that they made it off of. Like this. This is its. This is its type of revolver. The detective special. So it's not going to be long after this in the book that you're going to see them pop up. And these things are in thirty-eight. So here they go. So they started. Here's what's interesting is. These bankers specials, these were not in 38 special. These were in, see, there's 22 caliber ones. And here's, and this is case with a fits right there. Interesting, right? Hope I'm not getting any glare here. It was, uh, Thirty-eight, you know the thirty-eight Smith and Wesson cartridges. That shorter cartridge is what these guys were in. That's why, if you see the frame, the frame is a little different. See if I can zoom here a little. The frame, you could see it right there. That it's shorter. See how here that space right here is longer, and then here it's shorter. That's how you could tell these. So they're actually a little bit smaller. And the reason they were able to be shorter is because the cylinder itself is shorter because it was a different round. So these banker ones, these banker snub nose were originally in 38 Smith & Wesson or, or in 22. They have an interesting history also. And the police positive. And now here's the detective special. Thirty-eight special. Mm -hmm. 
here's that cover you could get with it too. Detective Special with two inch barrel showing hammer shroud that was available at extra cost. Ejector head not as issued. Oh, so they're letting you know that somebody made a modification right here. And uh, see, then we move into Border Patrol and Diamondback models. But here's what's interesting. Let's, let's just look at the Cobra quickly, though. So if you move ahead. So the Cobra first started in, the, in 1950, okay? This is where that Air Crewman, Courier, and Agent revolvers are all from. So if you see any of those designations on the barrels, they're out of the Cobra series. So only the detective specials, uh, only the detective specials were were all steel, and then it was the bankers. If you see banker on it, I'm pretty sure those said bankers on the barrel. Not 100 percent sure. Markings on left side about banker special. It said those would be. You know, I don't think they're in 38 uh, special. And then it would say detective special on them. Now the cobras, they say cobra on them. These are alloy. And uh, 22 long rifle, 32 Colt, 38 Colt, 38 special. Right. Now the air crewman. Here's where it starts to get interesting. It actually says air crewman on the side. There's some of these. They're very rare. I mean, you, you check into these. Man, these are crazy. These were the ones that were alloy with an alloy cylinder. They didn't, they didn't last. Then there's this Courier one. What was special about this one? 32 Smith & Wesson long and short. 32 new police six shot. These are, again, just made in weird, different calibers. Not 38 special, but cylinder steel frames. Colt, Colt alloy. Same material as the standard frames of the Colt and Agent revolvers. Uh, the Agent here. Interesting. The trooper. Where was the one? It was one that had. Oh, it was. The, it was this air crewman. Look, it's the only one that has wood. Let me. I thought this was interesting. These grips are unique in that they go up here to cover where that screw would be. You notice all the other ones. They all end here. You know, like mine. They they end down here. There's no screw there, actually. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, there's a screw on the other side, so that's why I knew it covered a screw. Not on this side, but on the other side, it covers a screw. So you see, this is the only one with a grip that comes up here. Unique. If you ever see that, if these grips are ever even on a regular one, you know that these are air... And look, it has a special logo even in the middle there. That's not the normal... That's not the normal Colt logo even. One of those things, you know, you, you're poking around at some some old, like, I don't know if, like, necessarily a gun store or a gun show. The guy would know what he's got there. But at, like, some kind of, uh, you know, like at a pawn shop or something. So, uh, yeah, so those are, the, those are the differences. Those are the different unique models I found. But uh, this was the guy that I decided to go with. Well, let's get into... I want to talk a little bit about uh, about how I bargained for this thing and like a little technique that you could use for bargaining, let's say. Let's, uh, let's get out a piece of paper here so we can write. Let's just say all right. Let's just say, I'm going to just throw out a number here because I always hate to discuss numbers of what I paid for something and what something costs. But let's just say this guy is selling this gun for 1100 That's the price tag he's got on there, $1,100. let us say you want to spend 900 on this guy. That was what that's what would make you happy. He's here. You want to be there. So bridging this gap. The skill is in knowing how to bridge that gap and getting there. Now with traditional bargaining, he wants eleven hundred. 
you want you if you tell them I, I, I wouldn't pay a dollar over 900 you just tell them that and you're saying I won't pay a dollar over 900 that might just end the deal right there for you you might just say like well I'm not just dropping 200 bucks off the price I mean if if he if he will be happy with the 900 you'd be lucky but normally that's not how bargaining would work he um, would probably just looking at the fact that he wants 1100 for it and that you want to be around the 900 area probably it would end up around a thousand bucks but that's not where you want to be you want to be at 900 so let's just say even if you asked for 800 you say like well, to get to 900 you still he's going to come down he might say all right listen i can't do 800 i can't do 850 i could i'll knock 50 bucks off i could do i could do uh 1050 but that's the best like that's the best i could do i'll knock 50 bucks off you'll have a guy that'll knock a little bit off if you ask for like you could do it that way to get to get it for uh 10 or you could ask a thousand and maybe you'd meet in the middle somewhere at 10 50. or if you asked for 850 and he said 10 50 and you said 875 uh, uh 875 he'd come down to 10 25 you'd come up a little whatever you'd come up and down a little and you're still going to meet in that thousand dollar middle ground if you want to end up at 900 you're gonna have to ask this guy for something so low that it's going to be ridiculous you can't ask him for like 700 and then he's coming down a little and you're coming up a little until you reach 900 and it's going to be it's going to be ridiculous at some point he's going to be coming down 10 you're going to be going up 10 he's going to be coming down 10 you're going to be going up 10 bargaining bargaining isn't going to work that way you got like at the most two maybe three rounds of bargaining back and forth in a deal like that before somebody is just going to put their foot down and be like that's it i'm not going any lower than that um, he's not going to be there all day knocking back and forth for in five dollar increments like it's like some kind of ebay thing or something so this is what i like to do if 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 i see something at this price and i want to get it for this price this is what i would say i would say i i use things to my advantage things like like tax okay tax is always an aspect when you're dealing with a gun store or whatever people pay tax so i would say to this guy how about a thousand out the door now what that does for me see i'm not saying how about a thousand and we don't pay tax let's cheat the government out of this and i'll pay you a thousand and i would say and i got cash i have cash always have cash in your pocket the reason why you might want to do a cash deal and and this might work is because they pay a credit card fee that's a fact of life if you're paying cash it costs him less to do the transaction whereas it costs you the same thing it actually might be better for you to use the card because you could get like rewards you might be getting five percent back on everything you spend who the hell knows what and you don't have to pay it all off right away if uh, you're pressed for cash you just pay it off a little at a time um, so actually cash might not be an option for you but if it is it's a huge bargaining chip because it's like you're giving up something and he's getting something for you for you using cash so if all things are the same and you just pay off your credit card as soon as the bill comes anyway and it doesn't really make a difference stop at the cash machine and have cash in your pocket because it can help so in a case like this you're not saying we're, we're not going to pay tax here you're just basically telling the guy the tax is on you so it's not like you got to sit there and figure out figure it out either he's the one that would have to figure it out in other words when the money comes in the tax is paid by the business the business whatever portion of that is supposed to go towards tax the, the business pays so if they charge you eleven hundred dollars let's say and then on top of that there's tax where it comes out to almost twelve hundred or right about 1200 you're paying that to them that's not their money they have to kick that money over to the government so what's the difference whatever they take in they have to pay a certain amount of that towards tax so what you're basically saying if you say i'll do a thousand out the door it's not like tax isn't going to get paid 
And if you pay him cash and he doesn't pay tax, I mean, that's on him. It's, it's his responsibility. What you're basically saying is, whatever it comes out to, less the tax, this would be about, about 900, and I think it would come out to something like 913 bucks. You'd be much closer to your 900 number, let's say, if, uh, if, you, if, if you did it this way. And it's one single shot by saying, how about a thousand cash? You could even, a power play is even, you put the $1,000 bills right down next to it. Let's pull them out of your pocket. You don't have to slam it down like a freaking nut job. But you could just put the money right on the table right next to it. How about a thousand cash? He's looking right at that money. It's right there. It's not like he has to make a counter offer now at this point. You are just making a straight up end all offer right there, which there's no countering where he could say, I'll do 1150, I'll do 1050 out the door because the money is down and you're, that's it. That's your offer that you're making. And this works a lot of the time because he's looking at it like you're dropping a thousand. I mean, uh, you're, you're dropping down to a thousand bucks, which might have been his number in the first place because he might ask a little bit more especially in a place where people wheel and deal a little bit he's going to ask a little bit more than he wants for it and 1100 let's say would even just it was just glaringly looking like he would take a grand for it so by you putting the thousand on the table and it's cash he's real close to where he wants to be and you're real close to where you want to be and when both of these sides are settled, that's when the deal gets made, right? When both sides are happy. This is a good technique. Whatever somebody's asking for something, figure out where you want to be and factor in what the tax would be to end up there. And then just make an offer for out the door. Give you a thousand cash out the door right now. And the money goes down on the table. It works. And uh, in a case like this, it did work. And like I said, both parties are happy. So it's not like you're running away like a bandit and you can never go back to this place again because it's like, oh, that's the guy that screwed me on that deal that one time. Everybody's happy. It's just a... It's a... Uh, it's psychological. You know what I'm saying? Psychological. <laughs> well... That's my video right now on the Colt Detective Special. I got a really good feeling I'm going to watch this one over again. And uh, it's never going to get posted. So if you're watching, if you're actually watching this, I went against my better judgment. Sometimes it takes two or three to get it right. But I don't know if I have the energy. I really don't. But so now, now my... Um, my uh, Colt Detective Special has some friends in the uh, Colt Army and the, uh, the officer's model. Colt, by the way, you know what's cool about Colt? They um, got some empty shell casings here. What's cool about Colt is that when you load it, you index the round easily, like right there. You go, okay, that's the next one to go. Because when... It rotates. That's the one that rotates into uh, into the cylinder. Whereas with uh, with Smith and Wesson, I don't know if you know this. With Smith and Wesson, if you try that, if you go like, okay, wait here, I'm gonna put this in, and it's the next one to go. It's right there, and then when you, when you pull the trigger, it goes the other way. So you have to you have to index it. It's weird. You have to come this way, and then you can't really see it until you already close it, and then it wasn't in the right spot. It's like not the easiest thing in the world to index it for coming up next. You got to kind of look on this side to see is there a round in the chamber coming up. Not that that's a huge tactical disadvantage in any way, but it is kind of interesting that they rotate in the opposite direction, and uh, and they always did, but. See, this Colt Officer's model is beautiful, too. It's like a really, really nice shape. So it's nice that uh, they have a, 
a brother. You know what's cool about Colt too? When you when you're gonna buy these things, right? With Colts, of course you open it up, make sure it's empty, close it up. This is how the guy in the gun store will know what you're doing. You cock it. You can feel how much play there is when it's just sitting there loose. You're going to feel a little bit of play. But here's the thing. When you lower the hammer with your finger on the trigger, keep your finger on the trigger, it shouldn't move at all. It should be totally locked up. So when they get a little older, you'll feel a little bit of movement here. That's that's the bad spot to feel movement. It should be indexed perfectly at this point. So if you relax the trigger a little bit, you have movement. But when you're squeezing, it should lock it totally. So you see this this one has not much mileage on it. You see this is solid too. I think this guy might have a little bit of movement because he's a little older and a little more used. Nah, it's totally locked up. <laughs> totally locked. These Colts are awesome. They really are. Uh, it's funny the differences between the Colts and the Smiths because they're both such high quality. How could they be different but both be such high quality? Uh, they are... And uh, you could play around with these. Uh, you play around with these guys and uh, the realistic snap caps. I'll show you right now. You put in some empty cases. You have fun practicing with uh, your revolver. You put in some empty cases. So, like this is your. This is your condition. Your reloading condition. This is uh, the you know the condition where you're going to need to reload. And here's your. Uh, Here's your speed loader. Here's the realistic snap caps. How awesome are these things? Actual weight, actual materials, feel real, look real. They even have a primer in there. It's made out of silicone, so it's nice and cushy for the firing pin to hit, so you don't have to worry about dry firing. And uh, you can even look at it after firing to see how, how well your firing pin is contacting the rounds. Is this closing in here properly? I think so, yep. And uh, there, these things are marked Model 10. I think that's what the 10 is for, for the Smith & Wesson Model 10. But they work well with Colts. So you do your little ejection. Loading. We're reloaded. And again, like I said, you could dry fire on these guys. And uh, see that you're uh, hitting the... And the primer's good. And again, people are cringing. We don't want to put drag marks on it, do we? No. Here's the big question now. The big question is actually, do we uh, do we take this thing to the range and shoot it if it really is never been fired before? Do we take it to the range and fire it? That is the question. What do you think? You got some time in the comments because I'm not going to the range for a little while. Back to work on Monday. And we got some uh, few weeks of steady, straight work. But figure by uh, by the end of March, the range is going to start looking good. There's a gun show next weekend as well. So uh, leave in the comments what you think. I think I already know what I'm going to do. And it involves shooting. See y'all later. Take care. Yes. Yeah.